Good afternoon slash evening to everybody who is joining us for this uh, webinar. We're going to um, spend a, the rest of this webinar with a fantastic team from Bombay School in New Zealand. I'm not going to talk too much about them because they're going to introduce themselves. Um, I, if you have never joined one of our webinars, my name is Chris Hart, and I am uh, very, very fortunate to be your host tonight. I'm just going to jump over and share a screen because uh, there are a couple of little notices I'd like to uh, share with you guys. So hopefully you'll be able to see my uh, slide deck. So um, Bombay School in New Zealand is, the, is the, uh, the story we're telling tonight. And we're talking specifically about increasing access to technology and improving learning outcomes. So delighted to have Paul and Susie, the principal and deputy principal there. And um, I'm going to ask them lots of questions. And don't forget that if you want to ask a question, there is a live chat box next to this video feed. So please feel free to um, ask your questions in there. And I will potentially interrupt or wait until the end um, and ask the questions on your behalf. So just while we're getting going, um, the introductions we're going to do, and then a couple of Google updates. We're going to then get the Bombay School story and uh, Q&A after. But as I say, if I feel it's appropriate, and I don't want to um, get in the way of Susie and uh, Paul, but I, I might ask some questions as we go along as well. So just um, a couple of updates from Google. The, um, our next upcoming webinar is on the 15th of June. Um, that's 6 p.m. Australian time, 8 p.m. New Zealand time. Uh, and it's about empowering learners in a Chromebook school. And that will be Amaru School from the Australian Central Territory, um, Capital Territory, I should say. And um, they will be sharing the incredible use of Chromebooks um, around, uh, in particular, pastoral and also student-led agency using Chromebooks. So please do um, tune in for that. And the next thing I'd like to share with you is if you have some uh, yourself or indeed some of your colleagues who are interested in getting involved in the uh, Innovator Academy in Sydney, uh, that is a Google run, Google for Education run academy uh, on the 16th to the 18th of August. And applications close June 26th. Essentially, um, you need to have your level two Google certificate. And you then need to have an idea around um, a, a really innovative project that you would like to um, share. And then come along, have a couple of days working on your project, meeting an incredible network of people, and then uh, being allocated a mentor who will take you through your project for the, the following 12 months. So a really fantastic opportunity. Uh, very limited. Um, I think it's probably about 50 people. But definitely worth having a look at. So if you want to Google Innovator Academy Sydney, um, you'll find the link uh, there. So without further ado, I am actually going to um, drop off this uh, share, this screen share. And I'm going to ask Paul to share his screen. There we go. So he's just doing that now. And then we're going to get started with the content, because you don't want to hear from me. You really want to hear from these fantastic uh, educators over in New Zealand. So I'm going to pull up your screen there, Paul. So if you want to go onto the slide deck. Slide deck, one second. And Beautiful. So uh, as without further ado, I'm going to pass over to um, Paul and Susie. But my first question, I guess, is really, could you give us a little bit of um, context around your school? and I guess the start of what your digital journey has been. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, everyone. Welcome. Uh, Chris, thank you for the opportunity to share with you all. I'd also like to welcome Susie Stafford-Bush, our deputy principal this evening. Susie, thank you for taking time out this evening. We really appreciate that. And as I said, welcome to all the participants. We'd um, love to share our journey with you. And I guess the operative word there is journey. It's by no means complete, and it's by no means perfect. But it is a journey, and we'd like to share it with you, warts and all. It's about our partnering, partnering with Google and our one-to-one -one Bring Your Own Chromebook program. So just by way of a brief introduction, I'm going to play a video for you in the top right-hand corner of the screen. And oops. Just muted me quickly, sorry about that. It was shot by our students and it was using a drone belonging to one of our children. We're a medium-sized rural school and we nestled in the Bombay Hills, which is the border between Auckland and Waikato on the North Island of New Zealand. The video on the top right-hand 
corner shows you a flyover of the school site. So you can see approximately the size of our school. As you can see, we are surrounded by farmland and rural lifestyle blocks. Our school role can peak at 384 students and we cater for roughly ages five through to 12 years of age. Our school is 145 years old. It is the hub of our community. And it, while it is firmly anchored in its traditions, it is also very future focused. In the next video, which I'll play for you, and I'm gonna try and mute that sound quickly. Um, you can see that our school is a very active school. Our children are exposed to a wide variety of learning opportunities. One of the early arguments in opposition to one is to one BYOD was that um, parents felt that children would spend too much time glued to computer screens when they should be outside playing. This has proven to be an unfounded concern, as you can see in the video. By the way, Chris, I am um, going to tell you that we embed these videos into our newsletter on YouTube and on Facebook. And it's all part of building a coalition, which I'll talk to you about later on. Just want to change my screen. Give me one second. Okay, so about mid-2013, the school began a trial using 45 Chromebooks. This was spread across three classrooms. And at the end of the year, the decision was made to go one is to one, bring your own Chromebook. Our board began a series of community meetings to bring parents on board. And it would be fair to say that there was a vocal minority of parents who did not support the BYO program. And that was for a host of reasons. And I'm happy to go into that during the Q&A session of this webinar. At the end of that year, 2013, our long serving principal retired. So on day one, 2014, the first day of my tenure as principal, 284 Chromebooks arrived on site. And um, that was a tremendous endorsement of the BYO program and a testament to the board and to the staff at the time who successfully communicated the imperative for change to our community. We knew that we had a lot of work to do. There were a lot of strands that we had to weave together simultaneously. We had to work on our pedagogy, on our professional development, on our IT infrastructure, on leading the learning, and on redesigning our old buildings into flexible learning spaces. With um, 284 Chromebooks, there was indeed a sense of urgency. And so I'll hand over to Susie now, who will talk to you about personalized learning, our pedagogical approach. Thank you, Paul, um, and good evening, everyone. It's evening over here, so good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, the, our pedagogy is based on developing students' own personalised learning and allowing them the choice and the freedom to um, drive their own learning. So in doing that, they need to know what they don't know, so they need to know their goals, forming their goals, and knowing their next steps and working towards achieving those next steps. That takes a lot of input by the um, teacher and I must say we're well on that journey now and um, we're getting some very fine results from that. Um, it also allows students to have a choice in the way that they learn and being a digital school um, that has just really pushed that on. Um, our student engagement has increased hugely. We do things like having a Free Thinking Friday in which students choose a topic, a subject that they want to find out more about. It could be well, how did money get invented right through to what happens with a cricket bat. And they research into that and um, we've, we use the Chromebooks. They have Skyped authors, they've um, contacted Antarctica, they have done all sorts of things which if we didn't have the Chromebooks and um, digital learning it would just not be possible. They are excited about their learning and they are just ready to rock it. 
Um, we also have introduced this year a program called Akoranga, which is a program in which students rotate around different teachers who have different passions um, so that we are doing things like Mandarin, we have Te Reo, we have two different kinds of sports. There's an art program, there's drama, there's dance, there's animation, there's coding. Um, students use Makey Makey kits and um, that's all going really, really well. We have a very positive classroom culture and school culture. Students know they're there to learn and um, they are in control of their learning. Uh, it's a very respectful place. We expect high standards. Our students um, come to school to learn. We don't have a lot of problem um, with absenteeism and being a rural school. Um, it's very easy for them to be coming on the bus or dropped off. Um, knowing our learners, we spend a lot of time, as I said, um, providing our learners with opportunities and also getting them to understand the process of their learning and the steps they need to take to get to the next level. In a lot of other countries, we have national standards and national, tests, uh, national standards and um, our students achieve really well with that. Um, collaboration is also a big part, collaboration with students, which is made very easy um, in a digital world and they work together really well, but also collaboration between our teachers, teacher students, student students and teacher teacher. We have three areas now which are um, innovative learning spaces, so our teachers collaborate and work with the students in there. Planning is all collaborated. We have um, a open easy to follow planning system in which we can dip in and dip out and everyone has access to everyone else's planning. And our devices, well, we have our Chromebooks and we have our iPads. Um, we just, they just use them as whichever tool they need to. Um, we still have students reading books and we still have students writing on paper, but it's very much um, whatever tool fits best, but without the Chromebooks, we wouldn't be anywhere near the, the pathway that we are. So that's been a really, really big shift in our pedagogy and our movement in teaching students. Um, and our, as Paul said, our um, journey started in 2013, and that was with a few Chromebooks through the school as a trial, and then 2014, it just snowballed. 2015 it was a move to MLEs or Innovative Learning Spaces and it has been the most wonderful journey. It's been a very trying journey at times but it has been a journey that I would never ever go back on. So uh, that's, that's, one, that's wonderful Susie. Um, can I just ask though, so um, essentially what do you have to make sure is in place or what did you? Or what did you even not make sure it was in place? So, what what are the learnings you've had around that BO, the BYOD Chromebook rollout? Okay, so I'll jump in there if, that, if that's okay, Susie. Oh, that's fine for you. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> we, um, Chris, we had a lot to learn as we went along. We did that proverbial jump off the mountain and build the plane as you go, and that isn't the ideal. But one thing is certain, it certainly created a sense of urgency for us. If you look at that um, text box there with the Cotter model, they talk about this is the Cotter model for uh, creating change and implementing change. Um, they talk about creating a sense of urgency. So we certainly had that going for us. Ideally, we, we should have been preparing for BYOD by doing a lot more PD. We had done quite a bit, but in hindsight, we realized we should have done a lot more. We should have uh, done more leading, leading of the learning and building very strong coalitions of the willing amongst our staff and our community. We should also have ensured a robust and capable network was in place um, before we implemented the rollout. But those are lessons that come with 2020 hindsight. We jumped off the cliff and our plan was gliding and we simply had to move quickly. Would that be fair to say, Susie? Uh, uh, yes, I totally, totally agree with you. We were building that engine as we were flying along. Mm. 
So um, as Susie previously explained, we, we had sorted out our pedagogy. We knew that we were, we were implementing personalized learning and we had begun supporting staff with appropriate professional development. We knew that we had control over where we were leading our learning at our school and we had a confident vision and a, and a good, clear strategic direction. We had a, a cohort of parents and staff who were still hesitant at the time. This is at the start of 2014 about personalized learning and about a BYOD program. So we knew that we had to up our communication game and that was critical. We had to strengthen our coalition of supporters. I went over very early in 2014 to a Lions Club meeting. That's a volunteer organization which comprised many of our grandparents of the children at our school. And I communicated our vision to them over dinner one evening. And it was fair to say that at the end of that dinner, we had sold the vision to the majority of those um, parents. Now, the, the grandparents, the Lions Club is a key supporter of the school. They do a lot of volunteer work, raise a tremendous amount of funds for the school. So they were a critical component of our coalition. We, another strategy we adopted, um, Chris, was to wean our parent community uh, slowly off paper-based newsletters. We switched to Google Forms as our newsletter. And I'm going to show you a bit about, um, of that right now, so I'm going to jump to that quickly. I uh, just want to check, can everyone see this form? So yeah, Definitely. And I was just actually going to say that's a, that's a perfect segue. If anyone is watching the video and they, and they think it looks very blurry, um, can you make sure you go to the bottom right-hand side of the video screen where there is a cog? And if you click on that cog, um, you can set your resolution to something like 720p, which is high resolution. By default, it sets to a very low resolution, so the slides might look grainy. So yeah, please click on the tog, on the cog and get the right resolution. And just to say hello to Tony, who's, who is uh, turned up for this webinar, Tony Cairns. Viewers, it's always great to have him uh, here with us. And can I just say, I know you're going to show this now, Paul. I have never seen this way of using Google Forms. When you showed me it the other day, I was blown away. I think it's such an exciting and innovative thing to do. Mm. So anyway, explain what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chris. So in terms of building that coalition of supporters and communicating the vision to our parents, we knew that we had to give our parent community and the wider community around the school an insight, a first-hand or first-viewer insight into what was happening at our school. So Forms was a perfect fit for this. Um, you know that in a form you can have dynamic content. So we embed into the form videos. So you can see there's a little video. And this one, it's just giving parents an insight into what happened at the start of school um, this term. And I think I'll just play a few quickly. It's just a few seconds. I'll play a few seconds of it. So um, maybe I'll turn up the volume to just a bit. So as you can see, by embedding those videos, you're giving parents and the wider community an opportunity to see what you're doing in the classroom and at school with their children. And it was a wonderful tool to bring on board our parent community. Um, as I said, we, we embed dynamic content, but we also um, put in surveys so we can take the pulse of our parent community on any given day on any topic. Um, another wonderful uh, advantage of using uh, forms for your newsletter is the ability to add on things like your sausage sizzle order form, whereas in the past, a form would be lost in the bottom of a bag and mum and dad don't get to see it. Now they log on to our website or they go to our app and they look at the newsletter and if they want to order sausage for the sausage sizzles, they just go into this form 
and they go off to the sashi sizzle order section, which is a link at the bottom somewhere sometimes, and they go off and they order the form and it comes to the office in a, in a, a Google form, uh, sorry, Google sheet, which we can then manipulate and uh, work out the totals and all that sort of thing quite easily. So it saves time at the back end for the office as well. We found that engagement with the newsletter has gone up. We know that on average 780 odd parents and broader community members are looking at our newsletter on any given week. So we know that the reach into the community has been tremendous. We, we Sorry, Paul, we, just, we do have a quick question, which I think sure. is really pertinent now. Is um, And I think Tony's also answered on the chat. So we're having a chat in the background <laughs> here. Um, and uh, a few comments, like parents love seeing their kids in action. This is a very different way of communicating with home. So cool, loving the videos. Pictures are worth a thousand words. But Judy has a really good question, which is, mm -hmm. it's a great idea. How do you deal with parents who maybe don't have access to internet? Yeah. So if in, in our case, um, that hasn't been too much of an issue. Um, we're, we're in a very sort of affluent community. So parents we know have access. We did offer to present a printed version of the newsletter, which um, we would email as a PDF um, to those parents who needed them. We haven't had any take up that offer at all. We, we know um, that all parents are using it on their phones. Most of them, you know, 99.9% .9 of your parents have, have phones, cell phones. So we know that a, a large portion of our parent community are actually accessing the newsletter on their cell phone. And in fact, the actual Google Forms does a great job of resizing to screens on mobile yeah. as well, which, is, which makes it a really lovely accessible thing. That's fantastic. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. I'm just I'm sort of whirling the, the cursor around an area there that shows that we also link off to our lunch order form. So if parents want to um, order lunch on a Friday, they just click on there and they go and order the lunch. So the, the form has become sort of a multi-purpose tool, but it hooks parents in and it brings them into that fifth window, which is the, the, uh, the videos and the internet that, um, where we celebrate children's work. Um, so it's been a really a good thing for us to use. Uh, we did a great deal of work on ensuring that we had the quality of teaching going on in our classrooms too, Chris. Uh, and these were aligned with our strategic goals and expectations. We shared the video with parents so that um, they were in the loop as to what we were doing. Um, and um, we were trying to, as I said, strengthen our coalition all the time. Um, and then in the end, we had parents speaking very eloquently about our vision because they were informed um, via this tool, the, the um, newsletter. So I'll just go back there. Um, Susie, would you uh, mind jumping in there talking about the leading of the learning journey for us, please? Certainly, a lot of um, our journey comes from our professional development. At the end of the year, when we submit all our data to our Ministry of Education, we have a look at where our strengths and our weaknesses are, and that forms what we're going to do for our professional development for the following year. Um, and from there, we are trying to build capacity within our teachers. Our, we um, get a lot of outside professionals, some of them the very best in New Zealand to help us. And we also maintain this by having follow-up professional development during our staff meetings, our uh, fortnightly staff meetings. And um, teams follow this up in their team meetings as well. So we're forever focusing on what our vision is and what our strategic pathway is so that our pedagogy is continually maintained and revised. And as Paul said earlier, we always have our early adopters who jump on board and away they go. And we have those that tend to be a little bit laggy at the back. So you're forever being a sheepdog, kind of racing around, nipping at their heels and helping them to, to get along as well. Thank you, Susie. Um, Chris, I just wanted to show also a quick video about how we reached out to the wider education community. So um, one of our beliefs is that you, you need to communicate your message because if you're not communicating your message, someone else is going to be doing it for you. So we invited, oh, sorry, let's close that off. We invited the education community
So we invited the education community to come along and have a look at our, our GAFE journey at that time, Google Apps for Education journey. Um, many purposes to that. One was to, as I say, widen our coalition, but also to validate what our staff were doing. So the early successes that you get, you must get them onto the scoreboard as fast as you can and celebrate it as widely as you can, because the other cohort of your staff are looking to these early adopters and looking for whether or not they're, they're achieving success. And before they make up their minds to come on board this journey, they want to know that what they're going to be doing is successful and is, is achieving what we're after. So the purpose of sending out these videos, inviting people into our school, um, sort of achieved that. It, it sort of gave people comfort and that the school wa wasn't doing something crazy and um, really out of left field. We had roughly about 50 odd visitors come to our last open day, which was in August last year. It was a great success for the school. So I'd encourage other schools who are on this journey to collaborate, go out there and share with everyone so that they can see what you're doing. It does give you a great morale boost as well. In our search for uh, more cost-effective hardware and software, we, we tested a range of options at our school and we eventually settled on Google Chromebooks as, as, as our preferred device. We wanted to be sure that we had very robust devices at, at school that were easy to re-image that were easy to deploy, and that were easy to manage. So we decided on the bring your own Chromebook policy as opposed to bring your own device. Quite critical in our view and very important to our success. We, we, we don't allow other devices onto our site, apart from a, um, a few iPads that we provide ourselves. Uh, Paul, can I just uh, jump in for a tick? Sure. Uh, just a couple of questions um, which I'd hate to lose because I think the um, they're, they're quite relevant. Just some, a really straightforward one. Is the newsletter form openly available via the school website, or is it just email to parents? No, it's open via the school website. So if you go onto our website, the front page of our website, you'll see a link to our newsletter. And there was another question. And I'm, I'm sure, Lynn, this is maybe um, we don't want to discuss figures, but Lynn is really interested in the, the, the IT budget and, so, and your investment, which I think you've started to answer. You've got a device which is very affordable and yet robust. And so uh, if there's anything else you want to add to that, please feel free. But um, you certainly don't have to divulge your budgets. Oh, no, absolutely. Um, finances is an open book at school, so mm. um, I'm happy to do that. Uh, a big saving for us was uh, because we had gone and moved everything over into Google Drive on, on the cloud, we didn't have a need anymore for that massive server that was costing us on average about 12000 a year to lease. So as soon as we'd successfully migrated everything over into Google, we phoned up the lease company and said, look, we'd like to return this server. What does it cost to buy it out? And uh, we settled that figure. And then we took that 10,000, so 12,000 a year, times it by three and bought $36,000 worth of furniture for our flexible learning space. So that was the saving. In going on to cloud, we saved 36000 over three years. It was a tremendous uh, benefit to us. Um, as I said, the, the, the only real cost is making sure that you have a robust IT infrastructure, so your um, wireless networks, that you have been SNAP upgraded, that um, you are supporting with the um, accessory things that people need, like plugs and HDMI cables and televisions and so on. That's where the cost, initial cost comes in. But um, uh, because our parents are paying for these devices, it's student owned, it's not owned by the school. We don't carry the cost of individual devices. But I know that someone's going to ask you about equity. How do we address those, the equity issue, you know, for those families who are unable to support um, purchasing a device? The Salvation Army in our area runs a no interest loan scheme for devices. So we make that available to parents. Anyone who is facing a, a financial burden can go to the Salvation Army and apply for this no interest loan. And the no interest loan scheme is geared towards families where there may be a poor credit history. Um, none of that applies when you, when you go to um, the Salvation Army. So, so that's a good um, sort of partner. Um, we haven't had any parent uh, choose to use that option at this point. Okay, so I'm just going to jump back in quickly to go back to partnerships, parents, and communities. As I said, it was crucial to us to build a good 
community of parents and supporters. Um, we have an ISP provider, a local ISP provider, who put up a, a, a wireless tower on our school premises. And um, in exchange for that, for us allowing him to do that, he pays us um, about $250 every month. So every two months, we can afford to buy another Chromebook. So there's another way of generating some form of income for the school. Um, just looking back to assessment and self-review, we developed a very rigorous assessment process at our school. We monitor the effect of these devices on our school and on our children. We regularly surveying our parents. We survey our children as well. And we look at the hard data. And later on in the slide, we're going to show you some of the achievement data that we've had since embarking on this program. But we are now at that point in our journey, some three years down the track, where we are going to review our pedagogy again, just to make sure that we're on the right track. And um, so far, all indicators point to the fact that we are doing well and uh, that we should continue um, with the journey that we've embarked on. So I'll just move along to the next slide quickly. So I think you're going to um, talk about something which came up and is extremely important. And I think I'm just trying to see who said it in the chat. This idea about, you know, it's all well and good throwing technology into a learning space, but what does that really mean for that professional learning and professional development? Because I think we all know that technology is only ever an amplifier of pedagogical practice. And if your pedagogical practice is poor, that's hard to say, by the way, fast. <laughs> if your pedagogical practice is poor, throwing Chromebooks or whatever technology at it isn't going to necessarily do anything other than amplify that practice. So I think I'm, I'm really delighted that you've got such a great focus on that learning. So I shall let you tell us all about it. <laughs> the first bullet point on that slide there talks about the effect size of leading the learning. It is the greatest effect size. It's uh, 0 0.84. And this is based on Vivian Robinson's research about student-centered leadership. So we are very cognizant. The first thing that you must get straight before you embark on this program is what is your pedagogical approach? Um, and as Susie had explained previously, we decided on personalized learning with those seven key factors. Uh, one of them, the most pivotal being students having a locus of control, a sense of control over their learning. And um, we, we scaffold them into that. So from the very young kids up to older children, we help them understand. I'm just going to jump back quickly so I can show you a video. Um, we, we help them to understand where they're, at the, where they're at in their learning and where they need to go next. Let's just have a quick look at this video, and, and hopefully it will give you a little bit of insight. just want to get the sound going. So, so the videos will, when you're watching them, guys, on the Hangout, they, you tend not to get great sound, and you tend to look, they look a little bit jumpy. But obviously, are they all publicly available? They are. Um, you, can, you can get them on our website. So I'll put a link to the school website in the description underneath this video. So if you want to have a look at these in high quality and, and understand the and you listen to the sound of tech, you can have a look at them there. So let's just have a look. I'm not sure we're getting any sound coming through, Paul. I think it's just, oh. drop, it's just dropping out. All right, I'll, I'll get out of that. That's well, just, I've, I've added a link to the um, to the description under the video. So if you guys, I really recommend you go and 
um, and have a look at um, those videos. I did a little bit of research when I knew we were going to have this webinar, and there's some fantastic stuff on that site. Cool. So, um, so we we're very clear about supporting teachers through their development, and I'm going to hand over to Susie, who's going to talk to you a bit more about staff professional development. Thanks, Paul. Um, as I said earlier, we spend a lot of money on our um, professional development. At the beginning of the year, or the, the end of the previous year, we actually have a look at our data as a staff and look at where our weaknesses are. And for us, it has been for many years, and it is New Zealand wide, that our writing data always tends to lag behind everything else. And it's particularly boys and particularly from about the age of nine upwards, we find that they are the ones who we tend to be targeting to push forward. So we've spent a lot of money with professional development. We also do have teachers going in and modelling for other teachers, which is part of our collaboration, so that they can see the best practice that's happening and we also get a lot of student voice back why do they find writing difficult what parts of writing do they like best and how can we support them in their learning and that all becomes part of our professional development so we make a, a year-long plan and we have um, target students which we need to accelerate and at the moment our teachers um, are focused on reading writing maths because that's where our national standards are taken from and they are taking accelerant groups so those students who are not at target but we're pretty confident that we can get them there by the end of the year they're pushing those um, students forward so that's working with teachers, working alongside teachers, modelling for teachers and exposing them to some of the best professional development that, you know, we can possibly have. Is that cool. all, Paul? That's wonderful. Su Sorry, Susie. Um, Tony's yeah. just got a question around, um, so he says that he thinks PD is super important, which I think we all agree. And he asks, are you guys a member of a community of learning, a COL, I think? Yes. Um, yes, we are. Um, we're, our community of learning is just getting off the ground at the moment. Um, they've done it New Zealand wide and we're all in our infancy. Um, our actual coal has 17 different schools and over 6,000 students. So it's a huge coal for New Zealand standards. And um, the focus for the whole coal is, of course, on writing and uh, personal inquiry as well. So we're in our very early stages of the coal and we're finding out as we go along how that's going to work. But we're very lucky in Franklin that we also have a Franklin Literacy Action Group yeah. which has been going now for about six years in which we all get together and um, help each other, support each other, look at the new moves, look at what perhaps we could do to promote literacy in Franklin because we know that that's an area that needs help. Does that answer your question, Chris? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> cool. Perfect, thank you. So, Chris, we, we also have five Google certified teachers on staff now. So our early adopters have moved on to that level, and um, pretty shortly they'll be sitting for their level two uh, Google certification. So it's great momentum. We're moving them forward, and it's uh, it's been a good thing for our school. Um, I also uh, made the point there that we make a concerted effort to keep the wolves at the door. Uh, schools are often bombarded with a range of new initiatives, and everybody wanting you to get on board and you get swayed by tidal waves of the latest next best thing. We try our best not to overload our staff and to keep the focus on our vision. So, yep, we keep a lot of wolves away. Our advice to everyone who's embarking on this journey is to try and do the same. Protect your teaching and learning time and, and protect your professional staff development time. Um, Susie, could you just jump in there about quality teaching and collaborative environment, if that's okay? Sure. Um, we have a philosophy that we want the very best teachers that we possibly can in front of our students. So uh, we have 
a wide range and ages of our teachers, from teachers who are nearly ready to retire, who a few years ago had never ever turned on a computer um, and now would never know how to work without it, to young teachers who embrace it, move it forward and are doing some amazing things with students. So working alongside our slower adopters has given them the support that they need and also brought them to the stage where they're saying, oh my goodness, you know, I need to get on board, I need to do this. We also have quite rigorous appraisal so that we can make sure that what's happening in classes is what's supposed to be happening. And when we appoint new teachers, we appoint for specific targets that they are able to come on board digitally and help us move forward. You know, we don't want any more um, teachers who struggle to turn a computer on. But in saying that, I must say that our teachers, uh, many of them are very open-minded and will go that extra, extra length. And that's also born through with the collaborative environment. Um, the, Teachers who are perhaps slower are seeing in a modern learning environment that there's other teachers there who um, they can model off, they can uh, learn from, that they uh, have to have their practice open and honest because there's people right there watching them all the time. So that's been a really big growth for a lot of teachers and um, they just never want to go back to working in a single cell classroom again. So, you know, it works and it's wonderful and it's exciting. Such a powerful so model I, to have that collaborative absolutely. team, you know. There's something really, really powerful in that. Just to give you guys a head up, we've only got about 20 minutes left, so just so you, just for your timing. Cool, I was actually gonna ask you that question. I'm gonna jump ahead <laughs> to, the next, to the next slide and um, cool. So we put up some videos there. Um, now, can I just check, Chris, are people still having difficulty hearing these videos? Yeah, it's just the, the sound's not coming through and they're a bit jumpy. So I'm there. I'm really happy. What we can do is put these into a little playlist and um, and put the link in the description. So I've already put the, the link to the website and we can put a playlist link in there as well. Okay. Um, it's, so I've seen some of these and they're really uh, fantastic. I mean, we can certainly have them playing in the background if you want while you're talking. Okay. okay. So I'll play this one quickly and I'll talk to it. I'm just gonna turn the sound down if it's not playing well. So just give me a second, there we go. So in this video, you can see that the students had to use Chromebooks to research the principles of rocket propulsion and aerodynamics. And they also had to research chemical reactions. Um, so if you look at the video, just look at the engagement in the students. Um, as they tried and tested various models of rockets, having success and having failure and repeating it. Um, that's just one example of how we've been using the technology um, to support our teaching and learning. We also embed that video into our newsletter, our YouTube page, our Facebook page. It's had over 7,800 and odd views on Facebook. So we know that we're giving our teachers and our students the biggest possible platform um, to share their learning, and it's been great for them. Uh, another little video, I'm just gonna pause that one. Another, another little video on this side over here is a student who um, wanted to do a fundraising project as part of her genius hour. Um, she, a member of her family was affected by a stroke and she was keen to raise funds for them. So she had to find out about the Stroke Foundation what work they do, and then she had to script this video and also produce the video. So she had to put in the background um, graphics, do the forming, do the editing, and then present the video. And then we put that into our newsletter and her appeal as part of the Genius, Genius Hour went out to our parent community. And I think she raised about 380 odd dollars from, from this video. So again, a, real, a very real life learning experience for that child. Um, absolute engagement, complete motivation, all of those tick, tick, tick things that make learning really genuine and good. Have a look at this one. I'm just, sorry, I'm just having difficulty with it. Here we go. This is using 
makey makey kits. So students have to learn about the conduction of electricity through liquids. And um, then they plug it into their Chromebooks, they create music. Um, and you can see this is right up the alley of particularly, I'm, I'm going to stereotype, but particularly boys, they love it. Absolute engagement there. Um, some wonderful learning. And again, the opportunity for this child to share that learning, not only with our community, but wider than. That's been great for his learning. Um, this one over there where the cursor is sort of waving around, that boy did a genius hour research project on walruses and he had to make a rap, so he uh, put it to the tune, uh, to some tune, wrote the lyrics and presented his rap. Um, this one over here, which unfortunately now that you cannot hear, is, it's a bit, that's a bit disappointing, but this student there talks about their learning and about knowing their goals and where they need to go to next. The video to the right, that one over there, is all about level four writers and um, the work that they've done. They're showcasing their work. Again, because this gives the children another opportunity to showcase their work, they get instant feedback via a newsletter and um, it motivates them. So it's quite motivational. The engagement really high as a result. I'm going to just move to the next slide quickly. And I think this is one that most people will want to know about. Um, just quickly on those videos, because it, it, you've got some really lovely comments that I just want you to hear. Um, and it's, uh, it's Jenny talks about the power coming through the context. It, sorry, it's being, let's start again. The power comes through it being such a relevant context with a genuine purpose for learning and sharing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's a, a lot of people who are agreeing with your, your real focus on the core importance of learning and not jumping from fad to fad. Uh, Scott yeah. has a quick question about, do you have an actual space in the school where you make those videos, green screens? and? Oh, we have green screens scattered throughout the school. So as yeah. part of that redevelopment of the learning spaces, when we were vertifacing the walls, we put in green vertiface in some spots in the school. And in the senior section, we have a curved wall that's covered in green and has proper Fresnel lighting and a, a good camera. We um, have sheets, green sheets, that we pin up anywhere we feel like. So often videos are made in my office. Um, yeah, we just find any space, basically. Mm. Mm. So moving on, so, so that's wonderful. But um, just as I say, I think you know one of the important things is, OK, so what? You've, you've done all these incredible things. Mm. What is the impact on? Obviously, we can see it on student learning, student engagement, student enjoyment. Is it having an impact on student achievement as well? Yeah. So just to explain to everyone, when we started the flexible learning spaces, the, the senior school were the first to move into a flexible learning space. And it was happenstance that we were able to design this space. The building was a leaky building. The ministry wanted it reclad. And so we struck while the iron was hot and used the opportunity to create that space into a flexible learning space for year seven and eight. So they, they're ahead in the journey compared to the rest of the school. Uh, year five and six area have only moved into a flexible learning space at the start of this year. So they're relatively young. So the only real data I, I want to point to, because it's been longitudinal over two years, is the data on your right-hand side. That's the data from our year seven and eights. Uh, Susie, would you like to jump in there and just explain how we manage that, please? Oh, I would love to. <laughs> um, yes, that's our year eight data from the end of 2016. And you can see that 91% of our students um, reached at or above national standards. Um, the ones that didn't were one sub-level below where we felt that they should be. Um, so we didn't put them in as at. So realistically, we could have had um, more than that, but we didn't feel comfortable in our professional opinion that they would reach standard, you know, be comfortably at standards. So our reading data was a little bit lower. 97% in maths reached at or above standard and 97% in writing reached at or above standard. Now, the, how we got there um, was a lot of very targeted teaching, very specific teaching. Um, we did a lot of acceleration, which is very different to remediation. Acceleration is when we go to where they should be, and if they're not there, 
we challenge them to get there, we plug in a few gaps and we let them experience success. Um, you can see that our students are very confident, they're very happy, they have a lot of um, self-esteem and that certainly built their, um, the way that they moved in their um, subject areas and the way that they progressed with their learning. Um, we did take small, as I spoke before, um, accelerant groups and really targeted them, pushed them. They had double the amount of time of reading, writing and maths as students who were um, above standard and that certainly made them move. But by them knowing their goals, knowing where they were going, knowing their specific learning needs, they were only looking at those needs and not everything else that they needed to do. So we were very, very proud of our data last year mm -hmm. and we worked very, very hard to get there. But um, we celebrated with the students at the end and they've gone on to high school now and are doing particularly well. We usually end up with a great majority of our students in the top classes at the different high schools. If I can just jump in there quickly, Susie. Um, Chris, we, we're not saying that this data is that what you see there is a result of having Chromebooks at school. There's a lot of factors that go into that. And, uh, and I think critical to this is knowing that these children, by and large, come from very supportive homes where they've been set up for success and they're well fed and they have all of their needs taken care of. So, you know, uh, that's a huge impacting factor on student achievement. And I just want to pay homage and respect to teachers in schools where they face an uphill battle as far as those things are concerned. So, yep, we've done all of this, but it's it's not solely Chromebooks, right? Ab absolutely, and I think, interesting, I think that we as educators totally understand that. We know it's such a complex tapestry mm. of different factors which help us to get this level of achievement. And again, at the end of the day, it's all for me, it's all about growth. Mm. It's not, it's, mm. you know, it's the, the growth of a child who goes from, you know, in, in, my, in, in my senior secondary from a 50% to a 59% mm -hmm. because they have worked incredibly hard. Absolutely. Like that for me is really powerful. Mm -hmm. But I do think, you know, the what you've shown in the previous things, um, in the previous slides about the mm -hmm. passion, the enjoyment, the authenticity, the use of the technology, all of that has to support, you know, it's all part of that picture. And I think the, the really interesting thing is I would just love governments and departments of education to, to, think, to worry more about those things. Than the, than the numerical output as well. So, so yeah, it is a complex picture, and we certainly as educators uh, understand that. So we've got about 10 minutes left, and we would love to take a couple of questions maybe at the end. So sure. um, back over to you guys. <laughs> okay, we'll jump ahead quickly, but I just want to show everyone that video where the cursor's sort of going around crazy, the bottom left-hand corner. If you get the opportunity to watch that video, it's about 12 minutes long. I think that encapsulates what we mean by personalized learning. Do go and have a look at it. We're going to jump ahead now to just in the interest of time and go to talk about why we decided to partner with um, Google. Susie, would you mind jumping in about collaboration being our central pillar? Absolutely. Um, that's one of our big philosophies, our big visions is this collaboration. And Google just opened the world up for us and for our students. It meant that they had a huge audience that they could go to. It also meant that the world was there, the world was open, and um, it also meant that they could share with other people across the world. You know, Grandma, who's in England, had ready access to what they were doing and was part of their learning journey as well. Um, it meant that we were able to Skype people that previously they would have no way of getting to meet or ever having the um, ability to interact with. So it has just completely. Um, mm -hmm. um, another important part of, of using the Google platform and particularly Chromebooks in our case, um, is the ability to work on any, any device in the school. So children's work sits on the cloud in their drive. If they come to school and their battery's flat, they just pick up another device and on they go. So there's no interruption to the learning. Um, also with Chromebooks, they can be re-imaged really quickly. So if there's a problem with them, we plug in a USB data stick and re-image the machine and Bob's your uncle eight minutes later, the child's back on their way. 
So we, that removes the pain points and the barriers that teachers could experience, the frustrations that they get when you have a BYOD program and any device is allowed onto the site. That teacher needs to be an expert in Windows. They need to be an expert in Samsung phones on Android. They need to be an expert in Google Chromebooks. It's just too much for a teacher. Um, so we, we found that going down the route of using Chromebooks was an excellent way to streamline everything, remove the pain points, make sure that if there was an issue, the teacher just sent the child off to me. I sorted that Chromebook out quickly, and they went on with the learning. Uh, another important point for us was the issue of it being really cost effective. As I've mentioned earlier, we managed to get rid of our large file servers, and we um, managed then to reduce all of that down to a really cost effective small server of a thousand two hundred odd dollars um, which is supported by one of our really good parents uh, also a board member happens to be our board chairperson um, so we reduce the cost we don't have technical experts or um, other companies third-party companies coming in to support our network any longer that saves us a tremendous amount of money the other advantage of using Chromebooks from our perspective is that they're pretty secure. So you know if there's a virus going out there, Google's onto it, they patch it really quickly. The operating system is continuously updating in the background, so you have the latest, freshest version of it. So all of that happens without us having to worry about it. Whereas in the past, I was sitting, pulling my hair out because I had to be an expert in Windows 7, in Windows XP, in Windows 10, et cetera, et cetera. Now I don't worry about that kind of thing. So that's been wonderful. The other advantage to going down the Google route was the interoperability between G Suite apps. So you could see how, in the case of the forms, we use that as our newsletter. But sitting behind that is all of the power of Google Sheets. And that helps our back end, our office staff, tremendously it cuts down a lot of their time. They don't have to. Um, uh, uh, sort of sort strips of paper and um, be bogged down by that kind of unnecessary use of their time. Susie, can you tell us about the biggest advantage of going down? <laughs> um, it means that all that money that we would have normally have spent um, can be redeployed in other areas. So, you know, thank you, Google, for being free, and may you always still remain that way. Um, yes, amen. <laughs> it means that also, you know, our students have free access to the world. You know, they can go to Egypt where we could never, ever be able to take them there. So it just is just the most amazing, amazing resource that we can possibly have. And it's free. So I think the other bullet points on that slide speak for themselves, Chris. I'm not going to speak to them, just in the interest of trying to save some time and to allow for questions. That brings us to the end of our bit in, in the presentation, and I'd like to thank you all for the opportunity and thank you for your time. I'm giving you an actual round of applause, and I'm sure that um, <laughs> I'm sure that people at home are doing the uh, the applauding in their own living rooms where they're probably watching. So um, we do have just a couple of minutes left. So if there are any other questions, um, please do chuck them in the chat. It's been lovely to see that you guys have um, uh, really been chatting away. So while you guys have been doing these present, your wonderful presentation, the guys in the uh, chat have been asking lots of interesting things. So there's some lovely comments that I'll share while I'm waiting for a question. But you painted a wonderful picture from Scott. I think that's such a lovely. A lovely thing to say, you know, you, you painted this wonderful picture of a great experience for for young for your young people. Tony, this was awesome. Uh, so, oh, Scott's got a, a question. Be honest, it's going up. Microsoft soft Microsoft software, e.g., Word is used in business is not using these products an issue. So, I, I can I'll take that question if that's all right because I think sure. it's a really interesting one um, because it all comes down to Microsoft. So, Google Docs and Microsoft Word are word processors. And you could put it on a typewriter. You could put it into um, pages on a Mac. It, I guess I think that the kid's ability to be agile and to use those different technologies, it's really just about the fact that it's a word processor. It's just a way to capture thinking in the written form. And, and I guess I, I never worry overly about, oh, if, I, if I've only ever used Google Docs as a learner, then I'm never going to be able to understand how to use Microsoft Word. And I, I think mm -hmm. that you know we can. We, we, we worry, we over worry sometimes 
um, about those kind of things. It's, it's essentially however the kids want to capture the written word. It could be on a piece of butcher's paper and post-it notes. You know, it, it, there mm. are lots of different ways to do it. Mm. Um, we've got super duper exciting. We've got fantastic words. You must have a really fantastic work. You must have a really great team of staff. Um, we do. <laughs> Tony, Tony said that he moved from Microsoft years ago and we just used Google. Um, Angela loves the newsletter idea. The parents who own business, or Bex says, the parents who own businesses in our school are learning from our kids and implementing their knowledge into their business. Yeah. Um, Google is, so Tony's talking about Google being free, reliable, cloud based, universal. Um, Scott's talked about the student agility and it's the way of the future. Do you guys in the, who are watching the video have any last questions that we're saying lots of wonderful things about you guys? <laughs> are there any last questions that you want to, um, that you want to ask these guys while we've got them here? Just while, just while I'm, um, I'm waiting for any last questions, I just want to take the opportunity to say what a fabulous, um, and I'm going to steal Scott's point, what a fabulous picture you guys have painted of those kids who are deeply engaged in authentic learning in a real context, using technology when it's appropriate, you know, uh, uh, but also demonstrating that you know, there are other ways to learn. Uh, yeah. And that whole thing around collaboration, not just for kids, but for your team of staff. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so really, really wonderful. And um, they, I believe there will be a, a, a written case study coming out as well. That's right, yeah. Can, um, can I just tell you one thing also that we've done? Because we want to walk our talk. We, um, as the senior leadership team that Susie, Kim and myself, we moved into the same office. So before the principal used to have this palatial little office um, and the three of us have crammed into that same space to sort of walk the talk and show that we mean business when we talk about collaborating and working together. And we found that a tremendous lift for us as a leadership team too. We're all on the same page. We know what's happening in each other's quarters of the school. Mm -hmm. The communication between us is really strong. The unity of the team is strong. The sense of vision is strong. It's been a wonderful thing for us. Would you agree, Susie, or am I talking nonsense? <laughs> no, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. She has to, sorry. <laughs> I put it on the spot. <laughs> uh, can I just ask a really quick um, question sure. for you guys from Angela? So Angela asks about young kids. What do you know to the, to the really young kids? Um, any ideas of the kind of things you might be doing with them around Chromebooks or tech? Yeah. So I'll jump in first, Susie, and then you follow on for me if that's all right. The, um, the key for us, um, at the time when we started this program, we felt that Chromebooks at the time wasn't the right tool for our new entrance to year twos. So we supplied them with iPads. But we've since learned that um, various manufacturers of Chromebooks have developed those flip Chromebooks where the screen becomes uh, a sort of a tablet. And that parallel to that, um, Google is opening up all of its Play Store apps. And so children can now access it. So over time, and, and I don't think all the staff know this yet, but over time, we're going to be phasing those iPads out and moving into the tablets that, so the Chromebooks that flip into tablets mm -hmm. because we will have access to the Play Store. So I, I'm actually using one of those right now. That's what I'm working on today. Right. I've had this for probably a month or so. Mm -hmm. and, and using the ability to have the Android apps yeah. is, is just a, a win-win. So before, yeah. as most as a lot of people do, you, you're wandering around with your tablet and you're wandering around with your laptop. Yeah. And the form factor that allows you to to transform your Chromebook into that um, Android tablet is uh, it's it is really really awesome. And I mm -hmm. I keep seeing some fantastic ideas around um, uh, you know things like Scratch Junior and the mm -hmm. Lightbox and those kind of coding because that's one of those areas I'm interested in. Those mm -hmm. coding apps which are great for young kids but are really tablet based. Now, yes. Resource-wise, it can be on your Chromebook and just yeah. it over. Yeah. So yeah, great, great comment there. And Angela says, thank you very much. Jenny Jenny says, oh, that is making me rethink our IT buying plan. <laughs> Thanks <laughs> for the info. Yeah. Well, listen, guys, it has been an absolute pleasure to Likewise. hear your story. It truly is inspirational. Um, and as Tony says, uh, he says here, this is really useful as we learn best by seeing how others do it right. and in, and us doing it in turn. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you You're to welcome. the uh, watchers who have enjoyed this. And um, the recording will appear on this same link. So you guys, if you want to 
come back and watch the elements again or if you guys want to share this um, for other people to view it um, as the recorded version please feel free um, and I've got the link to the school website in the description now so people can go on and watch those videos so, which I would really really recommend awesome so listen guys you enjoy the rest of your evening thank you again so much um, and thank you so much guys for joining in and watching our webinar Make sure that you get yourself along and watch the, uh, the next webinar and take care.